Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back here to this week's edition of Advanced Bass Fishing and really appreciate you guys coming by the channel to check the video out. Always uh, very grateful for that because I know that our videos here on Advanced Bass Fishing are a little longer than most videos I do and takes a little bit of time commitment. So really appreciate you guys coming by the channel here. Guys, today we got sort of a fun little video here, a little bit of a departure from our normal advanced bass fishing topics. We're going to talk about old school lures and how they still catch fish. And I've got, let's see, uh, three, six, I got eight or nine of my favorite super old lures here. And I sort of want to go over the situation when you can still catch fish on them because they some, it, sometimes they work even better than the new bait. So we're going to have a little fun video here and sort of uh, take a step back in time here. I'm also, guys, for get started in today's video, just our weekly housekeeping tip here to keep the lights on here in the tackle room. I just wanted to invite everybody out there, if you guys like the content here on, a, on a advanced bass fishing and you want to support the channel, the best way you can do that is a couple different ways. Just go to the, my description by putting the video, every advanced bass fishing video. Use and bookmark my tackle warehouse link. Just keep it bookmarked anytime you need to purchase fishing tackle. Um, the channel gets a small percentage of anything you buy off of there, so it's a good way to give back. And also, please check out our Fish the Moment Lake Map Breakdowns. Really good resource about learning more about your favorite lake or a lake you've never been on, as well as the rest of our links in the description. So, really appreciate that. Okay, guys, I'm sort of going to go through this here. Um, th these are the lures that I'm going to talk about here that I sort of grew up fishing with in the 70s, particularly. Sometimes, some of them in the early 80s, but most of them, these were the first lures I used to bass fish in lakes. I mean, started out fishing in creeks and ponds, and most of the time when I fished in a creek and pond, I didn't know anything about bass fishing back there. I'd just sneak in a farm pond or wade a creek. And I, the only thing I really used back then was like a little rapallo minnow, like a little three inch rapallo minnow in the creeks. And then in the po farm ponds, I'd use a spinner bait. This was back in the seventies when I was just, you know, still in school. But as I started fishing lakes, you know, this was back when Bassmaster was really at the their heyday as far as the magazine and a lot of these lures that I used here were seen in Bassmaster magazine back in the 70s and um, you know caught some good fish on them so we're going to go over each one of them here. Okay guys no ran no particular order I'm going to sort of go over all the ones here and we're going to talk a little bit about it here so first one guys is the old jitterbug man this jitterbug here is like 60 years old Jitterbug has been catching fish forever. It still is a great lure. A lot of people don't use a jitterbug because they think it's just such an old lure. But guys, a jitterbug now under the right situations, you can catch a ton of fish on it. It's just, it's just a wobbling, you know, just goes through the water just like that. Just like a, you know, some type of a bug on the water getting through. And a lot of people don't know about a jitterbug, but there is a sort of a cult following with a jitterbug on all the northern smallmouth lakes. The smallmouth will hammer a jitterbug in that clear water. <coughs> all you guys that <coughs> fish like Lake Champlain and the Great Lakes, try throwing this jitterbug over some shallow rock flats when you have calm conditions with you know not much wind and some low light conditions. Those uh, big smallmouth will hammer this thing. And also, it's just a typical topwater lure, any low light conditions with shade, cloudy, rainy days. Probably one of my favorite places to fish it around is some type of like flooded cover, throwing it around grass edges, flooded cover. It's a great pond lure. Um, what are you doing there? Huh? Hey, we're, getting, <laughs> we're getting ready to go down to the creek here in a second, so he's wanting to go. Um, but anyway, guys, jitterbug is just a great lure. Most of the time I'm throwing it like on 20 pound test monofilament line. You can throw it on heavy line. You don't have to use light line and just use just a steady retrieve, just a steady, slow retrieve. Just get the thing walking back and forth. And also it's a really good night lure if you want to use the black one here. And also guys, I'll put, I'll try to link all these baits in my tackle warehouse description if you want to try some. So I'm going to take a quick break here. I think we're going to go down to the creek with Elijah and I'll be back and finish the video here. Okay, guys, we're back. Actually, Elijah changed his mind. He wants to play out in the yard instead of going to the creek. So I'm back here in the tackle room here. <clears throat> okay, guys, that was a jitterbug. Get on to the next one here, which is another top water. And that is the old hula popper, guys. Actually, I got lost my skirt off the end of this, but this is another super old hula popper bait. Been around almost as long as a jitterbug. Now the hula popper is a little bit different than the jitterbug in the terms of how it works in the water. The jitterbug is pretty much designed to be real, you know, steadily across the surface where you don't stop it. It just goes through the water constantly. The hula popper is like the forerunner of the modern pop R or the chugger that we have today, like the Megabass Pop X. 
and it can be fished any pace you want to. You can fish it, you know, chug it fast through the water. You can bloop it like that and let it set, bloop it and let it set. And um, it is really good bait in creeks, guys. I don't know if you know it, but a hula popper is an outstanding bait if you float creeks or rivers. I remember doing it with my dad, him catching it. And uh, one of my uh, uh, old girlfriends, when I was, you know, in my 20s, her dad, his dad, her dad was like a, you know, in his early 80s then. He was a lot older than, than she was, but he, we would float some of the creeks and rivers around Southwest Missouri here. And he would have a black hula popper on with a, like a Zebco 33 and he'd cast that thing up under overhanging trees and just bl he'd bloop that thing and just let it set until all the ripples dissipated. Caught a bunch of big ones doing that. But a hula popper, again, jitterbugs and hula poppers, for whatever reason, they're really, really good pond baits. If you guys fish ponds, creeks, rivers, I don't know what it is about it, but a hula popper will really, really catch them in those situations. I think a lot of it is just the, the sound of it, the profile and the sound. Um, just a really good fish catcher even to today there. Um, now the next one will start to get in a little bit more diving baits. Guys, this is one of the, my favorite all-time crankbaits. This is a Rebel little or big or scooper. I don't know if it's a little scooper or scooper, but it's a real rudimentary looking crankbait. It's flat on the bottom. It's got just a rounded back on there. Just a, one of the early, it's one of the earliest clear lip crankbaits out there as far as the new modern design. Prior to that, most crankbaits you had were like the Hellbender or Lazy Ike or something, but the uh, the Scooper was one of the first baits along with like the Bagley crankbaits to have actually clear lip that worked like that. Now guys, the Scooper is still a really good bait and there's two lures that I use. One is the Scooper here and this is the Humpy. The re both of them are Rebel, the Humpy and the Scooper. For whatever reason, again, I'm, I'm not sure what it, the deal is with it. These are some of the best crankbaits you can use in the fall time of the year. They work really good in the fall, so, uh, specifically in the month of like October and early November. Um, if you've got water visibility that's probably anywhere between a foot and a half to three foot and that water starts to cool down in the month of October, um, it doesn't matter if you're fishing it around wood or rock or whatever. I have caught a ton of bass on these two crankbaits in the fall time of the year. Um, not too much the rest of the time of year, but in fall, they're really, really good. And most of them come in some type of a, of a, a primitive looking crawfish pattern. These are some of the early predecessors of a crawfish pattern here, but they still work really, really good. And a lot of the, one of the things about these old lures and any lure in general is that one of the, I, I found this out in my bass fishing guys. It's like, you can't hardly look at a lure and tell if that thing is gonna catch fish or not until you actually fish it. I have seen so many lures out there that look just unbelievably good and I can't hardly catch a fish on them. And then I'll take a bait like this that is a, it's a, it's a really a poorly constructed bait. I mean, it's got, you can see the bill is attached by just a uh, screw there. And you know, the cheap hooks on it, cheap O-rings, the components are really cheap, but for whatever reason, it's a fish catching bait. And that's the thing about it, it's like, the, the fish will tell you what they want. And a lot of times it's not how the bait looks. It's, it's a combination of how it displaces water, how it moves and vibrates and how it pushes water. Um, and there's so much that we don't know about what triggers a bass to actually commit and bite to a lure. And it's like, you can't really look at it and say, just because it looks good, it's gonna catch fish or just because it doesn't look that good, it's not gonna catch fish. Now, sometimes you can, I mean, Say for example, like with a, uh, some type of a creature bait or some type of a swim bait that just has a generic paddle tail, sometimes the attention to detail and the realism can actually be a big deal. But especially when you're talking about crankbaits, I have found with crankbaits that you just can't tell. You just cannot tell until you actually fish them. But I do know these are, are two really fish catching baits. Okay guys, the next one is the old school Hellbender. This thing was the king daddy of bass fishing back in the 70s, back in the early to mid 70s. This was the number one bass fishing lure in the United States as far as catching big ones on it. You guys have heard me talk about this before if you watch my channel very much about all the giant fish that I saw my dad, you know, and his friends catch on the Hellbender back at Table Rock and Grand Lake back in the early, late 60s to early 70s. Um, this is one of those baits out there. It looks terrible. I mean, it's got a metal lip on it. It's got a spinner. You can see it doesn't even have split rings. It's got the hooks attached right to the, the eye there. 
you know, low quality bait, but for whatever reason, guys, this thing attracted big ones. It catches big fish. And the thing about a, a hellbender, you know, when it still works, this is a good pre-spawn lure. So anytime that water temperature is in, specifically in the 50s, like in February to early March, this is when this bait shines. So it's sort of the same deal. It's like if you guys were, are throwing like your wiggle wart or your rock crawler or, you know, square bill during, for pre-spawn bass, where you have water visibility of anywhere between two feet or greater, try the hellbender guys it'll catch big ones and it catches them in clear water i remember that we did most of our fishing back then when i was a little kid down at Tabor rock and Tabor rock was a lot cleaner back in the 60s and 70s before it got all polluted and it's got a lot more stain to it now but back then Tabor rock had a lot of 10 to 15 foot clarity and my dad would put this thing on clear clear blue monofilament line in that real clear water at Tabor rock and just and catch big ones on this thing all day and this is probably the best color, some type of a, a white and black that they make here, but this thing has uh, got a lot of memories about that. Okay, the next one, guys, there's two different ones. Um, this is the Rebel Deep We Are, excuse me, the Rebel We Are. There's two different ones. There's a, there's a Deep We Are, you guys may have heard me talk about this, there's the, which is this. This is the Deep We Are, and this is the We Are. Um, again, a Rebel bait here. Um, the Deep We Are will run, you know, five, six, seven foot on eight to 10 pound line. And the shallow one is gonna run about three to four. Guys, these are outstanding crankbaits still to this day. Again, primarily in the pre-spawn. Um, all you guys that fish like wiggle warts and rock crawlers in February through April, tr try this Rebel Deep We Are, guys. This Rebel Deep We Are is a killer in the pre-spawn of the year. And this old Rebel We Are here, which is like an early predecessor of a square bill crankbait. That's what it is. It's got the exact square bill crankbait. This is really good in the summertime of the year, cranking it around any type of shallow water object. You know, shallow wood, shallow rock. I think that Jason Christie won a Bassmaster Open down at um, Fort Gibson Lake a few years ago on this old We Are. It was something like this. It was real old Rebel square bill bait like that. So really good for that scenario and guys the final one here um we're gonna i'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh we're gonna get this final one and then we're gonna spend the second half of the seminar here talking about how bass have transitioned in different type of cover over the course of the year as far as you know from the 70s 80s 90s they actually use different type of habitat we're going to get into that after the break but the final one guys is this rebel crawdad here this rebel crawdad is one of the first realistic looking natural baits out there and one of the things when there used to be a lot of bagley small fry and a lot of these crankbaits out there that looked really realistic back in the this was from the early 80s i have not caught many fish on them except for this one right here this is a really good creek bait i've never done that great on a lake on it but anytime you got this uh if you're creek fishing these little rebel uh, crawdads like here are pretty productive okay guys we're going to take a quick break here and then we're going to have a little bit of a discussion on uh, what has happened to the bass over the past 50 years as far as the cover they use and their mood and personalities. So we'll be right back. Okay, guys, we're back. Um, what I want to do sort of here in the second half of the video is I, I want to sort of draw some connections as far as like the old school lures and things that used to work back then and, and may or may not work now. I want to sort of talk a little bit about how the fish have changed over the years. You know, we know, we know that the lure technology has changed and all that. But the fish have also evolved to uh, do different things than they did back in the 70s and 80s. And one of the things that I've been able to do, which a lot of people that haven't been in the sport as long as I have, I've been able to witness this transition across the country, not just on a local or regional level, because I have literally been traveling across the country fishing tournaments for over 40 years. So I, I've seen, I, I've, I've got some knowledge that goes be well beyond just my local region right here and i've seen a definite change as far as how the bass move and act and behave so i sort of wanted to get into that a little bit now basically back when when i first started bass fishing heavily was was back in the late 1970s you didn't have near the fishing pressure you didn't have near the tournaments there were just the only there was only one tournament circuit that was professional it was the Bassmaster circuit 
and there was only like a you know 150 people that fished those that was it there wasn't any competing circuit there were club tournaments and there were buddy tournaments that was about it in other words there was a fraction of the tournaments than there are now there was also a fraction of the bass anglers on the lake so many times guys back in the 70s and 80s when i when i would go to the lawn tramp during the week there'd be no there'd it was very common to never see a boat very common and now you can't do that if you go to any boat ramp during the week you know unless it's freezing cold outside there's tons of boats every single day monday through friday out there it's, it's completely you know taking it to the next level as far as the amount of fishing pressure and then you also have the recreational boat traffic increased noise levels on the lake um, there's just more stuff going on and fish aren't stupid i mean a lot of people don't give bass the credit that they deserve, but yeah, I talk a lot about, you know, how long the bass have been on this planet for 3 million years. Archaeologists have found bass skeletons in Texas that have been carbon dated back to 3 million years. So you don't, you don't stay and you don't thrive as a species unless you're highly adaptable and you can evolve to meet the changes within your environment, which bass have. And that's what they're doing right now. They have evolved extremely quick. quick. Now, here's, here's the difference that I have seen in fishing. Back when I was starting my fishing and I was learning and I was spending a lot of time on the lakes, which was from about 1978 to 1984 during that first phase, that was by far the best time of my entire life to consistently catch big bass. When I'm talking about big ones, I'm talking about ones over seven pounds, which is um, a big bass for my part of the country. A, a seven pound bass in Missouri, well, there's two different t back then and now, but anyway, a seven pound bass in Missouri is equivalent to like a 10 pound bass in any of the southern tier state lakes. So seven pound is a huge fish. Back in the late 70s and early to mid 80s, it was very common to catch a seven pounder. It's like there, there, I caught lots of seven pounders not knowing that much about fishing and also not having all the lure technology and electronic technology. There was just more big bass in the lake. I, I remember back at Tay Rock here, back in the late seventies, the boat docks here on Tay Rock, they used to have like a, a big bass contest and whoever, you know, got the biggest bass of the week, they'd get a prize like a, you know, a battery or something or a fishing rod and reel through this marina. And there were guys in there that would be fishing every day and they they post the weights of the fish they caught. And it was common, guys. There was a couple guys that they would list, that they'd weigh the fish and they'd list them in the newspaper. It was like, it was as a section in the newspaper, it was called the Lunker Report. And there would be, it'd be common that there would be one guy that have 15 or 20 bass over six pounds in one week on Tabor Rock Lake. That is unheard of, guys, now. Those days are gone because right now, if you have a, a big tournament on Table Rock Lake in the prime time of the year, it usually takes between five to six pounds to win big bass of the tournament. And there's not many five-pounders caught. Once in a while, somebody will catch a seven or eight-pounder. Extremely rare. But for the most part, it used to take eight to nine-pounder to win big bass at Table Rock back in the early days. And now it takes, you know, five or six pounds at the most. A lot of times just five pounds and there's not many of them caught so from that standpoint there's been a big reduction in the size of fish and i think a lot of this has to do with the fact that you know people kept them and mounted them uh big fish die you know you know they're strained out more if they're in a live well if they're caught deep um, fishing pressure has just you know taken out a lot of the big ones the same with any game that you have and you know for the most part, conservation departments, with the exception of Texas, Texas has done a good job, but with the rest of the country, most conservation departments have done a poor job in fisheries management as far as the size of the fish go. So that has been one big change as far as the size. The next thing that goes with that is habitat loss. Um, habitat loss occurs from a lot of different things. It occurs from lake aging, it occurs from spraying, you know, a lot of you guys know that if you have grass grown in your favorite lake, there's always some homeowner that knows that's tied into some lawmaker that gets in there and they spray herbicide on the lake and they kill all the grass. So we lose a lot of aquatic vegetation habitat to spraying herbicides and chemicals in the water. Um, you know, there's a lot of habitat loss through um, construction. Prime examples down at Grand Lake in Oklahoma, that lake used to be 
covered with willow trees on those flat gravelly banks. And over the past 30 years, all the developers have went in there and bulldozed down all those willow trees. So their developments they put up on the lake, people can see out in the lake. And it's destroyed about 70 to 80% of the habitat that used to exist on Grand Lake. Another thing with that is a lot of different Corps of Engineers and, and lake managers, they, they do different stuff with the lake level, which affects spawns, it affects habitat, a lot of different changes there. But primarily the most biggest impact, aside from the natural changes, from what I've seen as far as the bass behavior has to do with the amount of fishing pressure. In my opinion, fishing pressure and, and noise in general is the biggest thing that makes fishing tough. Even though there may be a decent population of bass in the lake, if you have a noisy environment, and that environment can come from outboard noise, no, outboard motor noise, trolling motor noise, electronic ping noise, at just general activity on the lake, it shuts the fish down the same way that like a bad cold front would. It's like, you notice it too. It's like if you go fishing during the week in most places across the country, the fishing is usually better than what it is on the weekend because there's less noise decibels in the, in the water. Fish shut down, they become inactive, they move deeper, they suspend, they get, they're not as aggressive. And that's a big factor with it too. All of these factors have contributed to bass not being in the same type of areas that they used to be. Now what you have is most of the traditional, hard, what I call hard structure areas. Hard structure areas are like drop-offs, ledges, you know, maybe rock piles in the, in the water, something like that. Structures that used to be highly productive up to about 20 years ago are simply not that productive now because with GPS and all the technology, everybody knows where they're at and they've pounded those areas t completely. So what you've seen as far as the evolution on what the fish have done over the past versus now is they use a lot more obscure areas that is not the prime habitat. Instead of using a nice little drop off that has a stump on it where there used to be always a fish there, they're out there roaming in open water. They're out there on some flat that has no cover on it just to get away from the pressure and the noise. They will sacrifice premium habitat to get away from activity. And that's why you see the, the spotlighting be so successful is because a lot of those fish that lived on that hard structure and target oriented fish on the banks in the past, the pressure has moved them offshore, which allows the spotlighters to you know, catch those fish that were normally protected out there. So that's just sort of the natural progress of it. There's not really much you can do about it. I mean, other than the fact that we can do something about forward facing sonar, but as far as the, the amount of activity on a lake, the only thing that you can't do anything really about the recreational traffic. The only thing that can be done is the fisheries managers or the, the lake patrol or whoever's in charge of the lake has got to start regulating tournaments tighter. They can't be having as many bass tournaments that are on the lake. They can't be having as many boats in general on the lake. Lakes should only be able to, you should only be able to have a certain amount of boats on the lake at a certain time mainly for safety reasons. The more boats on the lake, the, the more boat accidents you always have. Up here at Lake, the, lake of the Ozarks in Missouri, there's always boat accidents almost every weekend because there's too many boats out there. It's, it's, gen, it's, it's basically a result of overuse for the most part. We've just, like anything else, it's just, just too many people love it. And, and when you have a sport like bass fishing, you can literally love it to death. I mean, the fishing pressure can actually love it to death. So sort of have to make some hard decisions. We got to make some hard management decisions to protect the sustainability of the fishery. And one of the things that I, that really frustrates, frustrates me is that fisheries managers from what I have seen that they will do studies. And for the most part in their studies, they, they say that the fish, the fish populations are pretty stable. But that stability within the fish populations does not equate to angler success. And the only way that you can really have a true measure of the quality of a fishery in a lake is by your angler success, by people that are fishing traditional bass fishing techniques. You can't equate the fishery, the fishery quality with shocking studies or with bass that are caught using technology because that leaves the average bass angler, you know, out in left field if they don't have that technology. So 
Main thing that I have seen about it, guys, is we've got to increase habitat. We've got to increase stocking. We've got to take people off the lake when those fish are spawning, not let them catch spawning fish. We've got to reduce the amount of tournaments. And uh, if we do that, we can have some sustainable fishing. So anyway, a little bit different video this week. Hope you all enjoyed it, and we'll talk later.